Hello everyone, welcome to Good Film Hunting, a podcast about an average couple who are on the hunt for some good movies. In today's world, we are consuming more media than ever, perhaps more passively than ever. But we believe that by documenting and discussing the media we intake, how and what we intake will change for the better. It is important that we don't just become another consumer, but a participant, seeking to engage with the media we consume, so that we can see how our view of the world affects how we perceive it, and how it affects how we perceive the world. In this podcast, we are not only on the hunt for some good movies, but on the hunt for a good discussion. So, lean in, participate, and enjoy. Well, good evening, everyone. James Scott here, as always, besides my very sleepy wife tonight. <laughs> Introduce yourself to the oh, audience. Savannah. Oh, she's so That's tired. That's my name. She's so sleepy. Sorry. So, um, this evening, we are going to be doing our take on Dune Part 2. Um, if you're listening to this uh, podcast for the first time, I'll give a brief breakdown of the episode structure um, we'll, I've got a list of facts about the movie that I'll get to Savannah, um, that she may or may not know about it. We'll share our general thoughts about the movie, our favorite moment of the movie. Uh, then we have a rating system with four categories that we'll rate on a scale of one to five. Um, and then from there we'll move on to our overall rating. And at some point we will move on to our next movie. Not tonight because it's very late, but at some point, eventually. I assume. I don't know. This could have been the last movie we ever watched. How mm. would you feel about that? How would I feel about How that? Would you feel? would you feel like it was kind of a disappointment to... Or, well, well I guess actually, we shouldn't get technically there. Technically, I watched Julie and Julia. And oh. I actually also almost finished the BBC Persuasion, too. All right. Um, so, Savannah, are you ready for some facts? I've got a lot. Yes. Buckle up. Buckle up. All right. Dune. Part two was released. Released. <laughs> Ew! Don't release it. <laughs> <laughs> was released March first, twenty twenty four. Was distributed by Warner Brothers. It has a runtime of one hundred and sixty five minutes. This is a very long movie, people. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's a very long movie. It, we're talking Lord of the Rings long. Um, one, I guess, its budget. It's unexpected. Not unexpected. Eighty four million. No, oh, not that. Bad. Not no, not that low. Uh, 284 million. Uh, definitely lower than that. 200 million. You're, you're very close. You, it's 190. Okay, 100. 190. That, that actually is surprisingly low. Yeah, considering it's such a long and massive movie. Because what did we watch? Spider, uh, Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. And that had a budget of somewhere between 230 to 300 million. Really? Yeah. I guess that's what happens when A, you don't use a ton of CGI, and B, you mm. literally are just filming in the middle of the desert that they probably didn't <laughs> like have to pay to use. It's probably just like a random chunk of the Sahara. Well, I don't know about that. I, I meant to look that up. I forgot. I didn't see exactly I remember where hearing they, where it was, but I don't remember. It. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, we'll go into production quality and how the budget plays in. But yeah, it's quite low considering... That it's that it's as big as it is and looks as fantastic as it looks. Um, so so far as a box office of five hundred and seventy five million, mm -hmm. so it's closing in. Last I looked, I think earlier today, it's closing in on six hundred million. Does the um, budget count towards the actors and actresses' pay? It does. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder how much they make per movie. It probably really depends on the movie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, carry on. Oh, you're good. Uh, but this makes it the highest grossing film of 2024 so far. Um, we're obviously not very far into 2024, so that very likely could change. Um, it was directed by Denis Villeneuve, or Villeneuve, 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 Villeneuve. I think people like to add the V towards the end, so Do Denis they? Villeneuve. Yeah, I think that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. Okay. Um, he's a Canadian French director. Um, who's often known as having the, I learned recently, the Apple aesthetic to his movies. Oh. And you can kind of see that yeah. if you think about it. That's funny. <laughs> um, but he's also directed Dune Part 1, obviously. He did Arrival. He did oh. um, Blade Runner 2049. 
you know, several things beforehand. Um, more of them are a little more ambiguous. Uh, the music was done by the one and only Hans, Hans Zimmer. Zimmer. Uh, he also did part one. And the Dune films were the reasons why he didn't score Christopher Nolan's most recent movies, Tenet and Oppenheimer, because they'd had a long streak together doing films. But because he was busy with these, he couldn't help out mm -hmm. the other ones. Um, naturally, this film stars uh, Timothy Ch Chalamet? Chalamet? Chalamet. Chalamet. I heard, I watched a video today, and yeah. um, it was just a comedy slash sewing video as oh, i enjoy it? sewing comedy but anyway she was like talking about she went to go see dune 2 and she's like and timothy chalamet still didn't make me feel butterflies uh, and that's how i feel about him too yeah yeah gotcha. not that i should be seeking butterflies i hope not but he doesn't make me feel anything mm -hmm. yes um so we we've seen him in little women and he has a brief role in interstellar um we've zendaya is in the movie um, her character's nickname is Johnny, not Johnny. I thought it was Johnny. Oh. It's just, I guess, something about it was hard to interpret, but okay. Johnny. Johnny, okay, that makes way more um, sense. So we've seen her in The Greatest Showman and the, uh, Tom Holland Spider-Man movies. Rebecca Ferguson was in here as well. Um, Mission Impossible, The Greatest Showman as well. Um, Josh Brolin was Gurney Halleck. Um, he's the guy who was friends with Paul, the old guy, oh, okay. who shows up halfway through the movie. Okay. Um, he is in the Avengers. He does Thanos. Oh. Um, Austin Butler does Fade Rautha, the psychopath. Yeah, so I just learned that today. Yeah. And I was like, I can see that now. You can see the Elvis now? Yeah. <laughs> that was really weird. I just learned that on the same sewing comedy video. Oh, that's funny. Uh, Florence Pugh's obviously art in this as well. Little Women and Oppenheimer. Um, Dave Batista is in this. He does Robin Harkonnen, the I guess the older brother of Fade Rautha. He's in Guardians of the Galaxy as one of the one of the dudes in that. And then he also was in Blade Runner twenty forty nine. So this was not his first time working with Denis. And then Christopher Walken does the Emperor. And I saw him and went, "We've seen him before, but yeah. what have we seen him in?" And I realized he was Frank Abagnale and Catch Me the Dad. Fan. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I feel like he's also, he actually also was in the 2023 Persuasion. Was he? From Netflix. I haven't seen that, so. Yeah, I wonder, I feel like some actors like go, like they become popular and then everyone like uses them in all their movies. Yeah, that's usually how that works. Yeah. <laughs> um, this also has Stalin Skarsgård as Vladimir Harkonnen, the, the Baron character. He's... And Thor, the scientist guy in Thor, and he was the in the the original main character in the original Insomnia movie, but we haven't seen. We've seen Christopher Nolan's oh, okay. remake. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And then Javier Bardem does Stilgar, and Anna, sorry, Anya Taylor Joy has a very brief cameo as Alia Atreides. And I recognize you her. recognized her. Yeah. Um. Also, isn't it Harkonnen? How am I saying it? You're saying like Harkonnen, Harkonnen. Harkonnen, sorry, it might be Harkonnen. It's sorry. Harkonnen. Harkonnen. Yeah. Apologies to all the Dune it's lovers <laughs> out there. <laughs> this so it's is... hard when you read something and then you're like. Mm, yeah. Har Harkonnen. 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 Okay. Harkonnen. Good to know. So I will I will correct that going forward. <laughs> <laughs> um. So as far as the production history of this goes on November 2016 legendary pictures obtained the rights to the film and TV adaptation of the Dune franchise um, the vice chair president of legendary Mary Parent that's a great last name um, began discussing the opportunity with Denis Villeneuve I've got to remember to say it like that Villeneuve about directing the adaptation and very quickly hired him after realizing that he had a major passion for the film or the books. Um, so he was quickly hired in 2018. And naturally, this film ends in a way which leaves us with the question, will there be a third Dune? Because I feel like there was, it was absolutely clear that they were going to do a third. You thought it was absolutely clear? Yeah, I was clear? like, this is super like open. Like they need, they have to do it. Well, third. it's not been confirmed. <laughs> they don't know. Because the first, these two movies cover the first book. So okay. the first book's been complete. There's plenty of other material to do a third movie. And they definitely left it open-ended 
they leave it in a way that there has to be some sort of resolve, but at the same time, if there wasn't another movie, like, it's mm-hmm. fine. It'll be okay. Um, De- Denis Villeneuve has said it would be his dream to do a trilogy, but he would not direct any more than three oh. movies. Oh. Because it's, if they did a third one became popular, naturally the studio is going to do lots of movies. <laughs> now we're going to have a like, Marvel franchise of the Dune world, Whoopee. which nobody needs. Um, naturally, Austin Butler said that he drew inspiration from Heath Ledger for his role <laughs> as Fade Ralpha. Oh. <laughs> Psychotic. No, he was kind of psychotic. Just a little bit. Um, as this is early in its release, it hasn't really won any awards at the moment. Um, as far as cool production packs go, so the worm ride sequence where Paul is riding a worm for the first time took three months to shoot. Um, that's kind of crazy and insane. <laughs> yeah. And it was all done in the soundstage. Um, Getty Prime, where the Harkonnen live, the planet, um, as you notice, was kind of a black and white sequence. Mm-hmm. It was shot using infrared cameras, which I guess end up capturing color and light that the human eye can't see. Hmm. And then it was desaturated to black and white, oh. which gave it the very... Gl- weird glowing essence to it. Yeah. Um, but the, I guess the mythology of, or not the mythology, the, the world building aspect is that I guess Getty Prime is so polluted and the sun is so dim that no, not enough light rays get through, I guess, to produce color. Hmm. Hence why it's black and white. It does uh, it say that in the book? Supposedly, that's what everyone's saying. No. I, I haven't gotten that part of the book, if so. Oh, interesting. Or maybe that's just part a creative decision they made in the movie. I don't know. Um, but if you pay attention on all the indoor interior scenes mm-hmm. in Giddy Prime, there is color. Okay. Which is interesting. Mm-hmm. But it's whenever there's light coming from the outside. Yeah, I noticed that it switched between black and white and color. Yeah, so that was interesting. Um, and then there were many sequences in the film that just, that should have taken no time at all to film. That took three days to shoot. Because they were doing it during the golden hour, which naturally mm-hmm. is very fleeting. Naturally. Um, and they did not use any of the same sets or locations from the first film. So mm. all of them are completely new in this one. Interesting. Um, as far as deviations from the book go, so this is a spoiler category. So um, it's deviations from the book. Um, obviously, the ending with Chani and Paul, they do end up together. At the end of the book. So in the books, they are together? They are together, yep. Okay. Chani's character was drastically changed for the movie. Hmm. She was very much in support of Paul in the book, but oh. they thought that it would, I guess, be kind of boring to kind of have everyone for him and not having kind of an opposing force. Um, so that was that was a choice they made. Um, Chani and Paul had a child in the book. Scandalous. And he was a year old, but he died. What? Yes, because the Harkonnens attacking. Oh. I know, it's really sad. I'm glad we didn't see that. Um, The time jump between movie, or the time jump between kind of what would be the first half of the book and the second half of the book, which is where the movie is split, was originally much bigger. It was like two years. Oh, because it like immediately picked up. Yeah, but in the book it was two years because one, Shawnee had a child. Two, um, Paul's sister was born. Um, well, I guess, yeah, the, who was it, just Lady, um, Jessica would have drunk the, the living water, as they call it, mm. which affected her child, and then would have given birth to her, and then we get the time jump. Oh, okay. And then her child was two years old, but because she had this special juice now in her veins, she could talk and interact with people. Oh. Naturally, that'd be very hard to do, so they decided not to do that. Yeah. But let's not do that. Let's, let's... not find an extremely advanced <laughs> two-year-old. Um, Fade Rautha was made a much more, m- much more of a large nemesis in the movie than he was in the book. Um, Paul very easily defeated him in the book because he was the best swordsman in all the galaxy. Mm. But they went, let's, let's add a little more tension there. Um, and also the Harkonnens have uh, red hair. Oh. In the book series. However, in the movie, not so much. They have no hair. They have no hair. Which I think 
as far as contrast goes, definitely works better. They look like aliens. They do. They look very odd. Um, yeah, I could tell they must have used quite a bit of prosthetics on Fade Ralpha. What's his name? Yeah, Fade Ralpha. Fade Ralpha. Ralpha. They mm -hmm. must have used quite a bit of prosthetics on yeah. his face because he looked very, like, creepy and, like, mm -hmm. bumpy. Bumpy? Well, like, his no, he forehead. Was smooth. You know, he was smooth, but, like, his forehead. Like, I felt like his makeup, he looked pretty accurate, but I felt like it was quite obviously a prosthetic. You thought so? Yeah. Hmm. Because, like, his eyes look a little more sunken. Oh. Okay. And, like, his forehead is very protruding, protruding. and I feel like it's just, it's, it is obvious. It stood out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that now. Not that it was bad, but. Mm -hmm. It adds to the alien vibes. It's true. <laughs> All right, so those are all my facts that I have for you. Um, let's move on to our general take on the movie. Um, did you, or what are what are your general thoughts about Dune Part 2? Um, I don't regret going to see it. I thought it was interesting. Um, I thought it was somewhat bad vibes. Mm -hmm. I thought it was somewhat boring. Somewhat boring. I, yeah, I think... You know this, but the mm -hmm. audience doesn't. I'm yeah. just, I am not a sci-fi person at all. Like, there's the occasional sci-fi movie that is interesting to me, mm -hmm. like... Arrival. Arrival, or Inception, or Interstellar. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, this kind of sci-fi, like, space and High. future. I guess this, yeah, okay. Whatever this particular mm -hmm. type is just not my thing. So I didn't, like, enjoy the movie. Mm. I didn't, like, walk away being like, that was a good movie, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't watch it again, probably. I wouldn't watch either of them. Wouldn't read the books. It's just not my thing. Yeah, but, like, from a critical point of view, it was good. Okay. But from a personal point well, of view. Personal like... preference. Mm. Gotcha. Um, so, I remember watching the first one and being, enjoying it very much. I feel like I... I feel like I didn't I say the same thing at the first one. Kind I of, like, I think you were you toned it down a little bit because we weren't married yet. Yeah, something. We like weren't that. even engaged, so <laughs> I couldn't be too hardcore. Couldn't too hardcore. But I remember leaving the first one really enjoying it. Um, the second one, though, the only thing I can really say about it is I'm really looking forward to watching it again, and I know I might have to watch it by myself. <laughs> um, but it was so big and so different in terms of pacing and story structure and there was so much going on whether it was visually or with characters that I felt like I almost it like glazed over me like I only saw the tip of the iceberg like I know there's more there to appreciate mm -hmm. I just didn't really get to in the same yeah. way that I would want to like Oppenheimer, I remember leaving that feeling like, wow, I really enjoyed that. I want to see that again. Mm -hmm. And this one's more like, I, I, I'm very interested to see this one mm -hmm. again, as opposed to like, you know, that was so good. Yeah. But I know that a lot of people like this, so maybe, yeah. maybe I'm just missing something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I feel like everyone we've talked to was like, that was such a good movie. But mm -hmm. like, again, mm -hmm. I don't like sci-fi, but like, yeah. I don't really see what was so good about it. It was cool. Like, mm -hmm. I felt like it was really visually pleasing. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting, but, like, mm -hmm. it was somewhat hard to follow at some yeah, point. Yeah, which might just have to be with one's understanding of the book or, I don't I don't know. Like, they obviously tried to present it in a way so that you don't have to read the books to be able mm -hmm. to enjoy it. Um, but it's a very, very dense movie mm -hmm. um so i'm i'm looking forward to seeing it again and maybe so everything i'm going to say tonight you have to take with a grain of salt <laughs> i'm taking it all with a grain of salt um did you have a favorite moment in the movie not particularly no. i think the um the process of paul becoming like more more like a more like a um Fremen mm -hmm. and like him kind of becoming integrated into the Fremen family was good. I like mm -hmm. that kind of sequence. Yeah. Um, I have a favorite, I feel like I have a favorite character. You do? Yeah. Go into it. I liked that guy, the Fremen guy. Stilgar? The like, the like old, yeah, yeah. like the oldish guy. Like yeah. Him. Doesn't he I remind you of, uh, 
Oh, what's the guy's from name? In... Fiddler on the yeah. Roof. Yes, that's, I think that's why I liked him. <laughs> um, but I liked him the the most probably. That's funny. He was he was a comedic. <laughs> he was. But not in like a stupid way. No, there wasn't really very much comedy. I was thirsting for some How comedy relief. I was like, please, <laughs> please, please. Um, favorite moment for me. Um, I. I love the one shot where. After they blow up a mountain, the Fremen blow up a mountain and come in on the sandworms. It starts with just like the army looking up at the dust clouds Mm -hmm. and then, you know, out of the, you know what's coming, Mm -hmm. but like out of it, you know, comes the massive sandworm mouth. Mm -hmm. And just something about that visually looks so cool to me because it's so well composited. I'm like, ooh, that's, that's terrifying right there. That's like. That looks really cool. I know. You're like, I don't want to see a sandworm. I don't ever want to see a sandworm. Good thing um, good thing they don't exist. Or do it's they? True. All right. So let's move through our rating system. We've got four categories here that we'll go through on a scale of one to five. Our overall entertainment, the overall production quality, overall writing, and overall content. Um, and this will be a very spoiler-filled conversation. So... If you haven't seen the movie and want to see it, go see it first. If not, or you have seen it, then feel free to continue. So, Savannah, we already kind of know your thoughts about entertainment, but what would you give this on a scale of one to five and why? i give it a three. Okay. I thought it was interesting. It was intriguing to mm-hmm. an extent. Um, yeah, I'd give it a three. It wasn't like, wow, but it wasn't like... Bad. Like I wasn't mm. like, Ugh, I can't wait for this to be over. Mm-hmm. Um, I was surprisingly not falling asleep during it. That's good. <laughs> which I was not expecting. Um, but maybe it was that root beer. Ah, uh, that might have been coursing your, through my uh, veins. Your my, quart of root my beer. That was more than a quart. That was like a quart <laughs> and a half of root beer. Yeah, I don't really have much to elaborate on entertainment. Mm. I have a couple things to talk about later. Okay. But yeah. I just, it was like, it was intriguing, softly intriguing. Softly intriguing. Ah. Oh, yes. Okay. So okay. Gotcha. I was not on the edge of my seat, mm, okay. but it was interesting. Okay. Yeah. I would give this a four. Um, I think, like I said, because there was so much thrown at, thrown at the audience, like to me, it was just kind of overwhelming. So I didn't really, I, I didn't really know what to think of it. I think going into it a second time, I would enjoy it a lot more um, just because this is right up my alley in terms of epic scale storytelling and fantastical and all that stuff so um i thought that the action scenes were really cool i thought that the visuals were very entertaining even if maybe you had a hard time understanding what was going on plot wise i thought that um the, the only thing that I felt like would have driven me more into the story is if I felt like I could connect to the characters a bit more. There was something about this viewing where I felt somewhat disconnected yeah. from all the characters. Like, I was a little... There, there was something in between us where I couldn't quite relate to them and be like, I understand your motivation mm-hmm. or sympathize with them because it felt more like I was watching them yeah. passively. So maybe that would change with another viewing. Um but yeah, and this is very slow paced. This is a very slow paced movie. Um, and I don't think there's necessarily an issue with that. It's just very different from what we're. Well, it's kind of like Fiddler on the Roof in the sense mm-hmm. it's slow paced. That one has a lot more going on at yeah. any given time than this one does, maybe. Um, but they, they take their time in terms of world building in this, which we'll go into. Um, the quality in the writing, but I think they they spend a lot of time world building in terms of yeah. whether it is visually or them characters kind of just explaining certain things, and it's none of it's out of place. It's just a very different pace from what we're used to in terms of I don't know Spider Man, <laughs> which yeah. we saw recently, where that's kind of go 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 go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would give it a four, and that could change. But I'm I'm pretty happy with the four right now. I think. Um, what would you give this for production quality? Probably give it a five. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like it was really well done. I feel like the only gripe I have about it would be that certain of the machine, like, bad guy spaceships or whatever mm. those are looked kind of fake. Really? Yeah, like okay. the shiny one. Oh, really? I feel like that looked fake. But other than that, I think I think I would give it a five. Like, mm-hmm. visually really pretty. Music was good. I actually pay attention to the music <laughs> in this you? one. Probably because there were vocals. <laughs> My brain picked it up as music. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but the music was good. Videography was good. Acting was pretty good. Um, yeah, everything was just... Mm-hmm. It was very crisp and visually pleasing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd give it a five. Yeah. I, yeah, five, like, there's almost no question about it. Like... Asterisk six. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this is where this movie shines. This is probably where the Dune franchise, as we know it, so. And far this is shines. probably why people were like, "This was such a good movie." Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, we haven't been up to date with all the latest superhero movies, so it's not like we're starving, in a sense, for good cinema because we've been going back and watching things, which mm-hmm. people do. Yeah. Um, our, our latest theatrical experience was Oppen, Oppenheimer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was very good and, and very much of a theatrical experience. Um, I definitely oh, would not say that Oppenheimer was as visually stunning as this one. No, no, not even close. But like, There's something about filming in the desert <laughs> that just is like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you can top that. It's, it's very true. shiny. It's and true. Very red. It's true. Yeah, I think the the color grading in this was good. Mm-hmm. Um, there was always contrast going on, like the red orange of the Fremen desert world, and like the black of the Harkonnens, kind of being very obviously contrasted. Mm-hmm. Um, I love how every race or culture had such a distinct visual look. Mm-hmm. Like once again, the Fremen Harkonnen, nothing similar whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And then you have like the Benny Gesserit with their weird headgear going on all the yeah, time. So and they just stood out as their own. Um, yeah, I just felt like there was very distinct classes and it was very easy to tell visually. And I think that was really well done. Music, I've listened to the soundtrack a lot because <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like it. I, I think the score for these movies is really good. Um, they're, they're very different from anything that's really been put to film before because they are such a soundscape. I feel like Hans Zimmer, though, has distinct preferences on what kind of sounds he makes in his songs. Maybe. Like that, like, sound, you know? I feel like every movie. Which? You know. <laughs> I don't you know, know that sound. <laughs> I don't know. It's in every movie that I've ever heard him write the score for. Maybe. He's very boisterous. Yes. <laughs> no, but... The the way the sound design and the way they integrate with the score was really good. The sound in these movies is really, really good. Yeah. Um, what else was I going to say? They shot in the desert. That's pretty cool. That probably was not fun because of the sand and the heat and mm. the sun. Um, uh, was there anything else about it? Yeah, cinematography was really good. I think the guy's name who did it was Greg Frazier. He he did a, he's done a couple of movies. The I've one seen. guy that did all of the cinematography. Well, he was oversaw it, the director of photography. Um, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think production quality, that's where it, this movie stands out the most. Like I, oh, I remember what I was saying before I got derailed. So uh, I heard I've heard different reviews on these movies to kind of see what people's takes on them are. And so, budget 190 million. It's pretty big, but pretty small considering recent superhero movies have had, you know, 250 million, right? Mm-hmm. But this looks like it's on a whole different mm-hmm. ballpark, like in terms of visuals. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is, is that every shot in this is obviously so carefully planned. Mm-hmm. And they use CG in an appropriate manner where... Obviously, you know, sandworms were CG. Like, you mm-hmm. can't really get around that. Or spaceships were CG. You yeah. can't really get around that. But it's not like the they were relying on it to fill in things they didn't know so much as just 
they were using it to enhance mm-hmm. the scene in yeah. the way that it needed to. Unlike, unfortunately, you know, most movies and superhero movies, especially fall prey to mm-hmm. <laughs> these days. Um, so it just has a lot to do with very intentional and very intentional filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which is very obvious. All right. Um, moving on to writing. What would you give this on a scale of one to five for writing? Whether that's characters, the story arc. Well, hmm. so here's a couple of thoughts. Okay. First of all, I'll just get this off my chest. I don't okay. like Chani at all. Mm, I can't. Stand you don't it. like Zendaya. I don't like Zendaya. <sighs> I don't like Chani because she puts off. 12 year old vibes does she yes the whole oh. movie she's like an entire child my my okay even though she's not obviously okay um yeah don't like her <laughs> also her and paul's relationship was not super convincing yeah it, i did feel it was a little bit confusing yeah it wasn't it wasn't very convincing at all it was like it was kind of convincing but like they just didn't have any sort of feeling towards each other yeah, she like. just always seemed annoyed with him. Yeah, and like, it just, I don't find Timothy Chalamet to be a very, um, he was like this as Lori in Little Women too, mm. which I was like, again, bad choice for that. But anyway, oh he, he just is very like robotic when I feel like he's be trying to be feeling. Hmm, okay. Um, at least in the two cases I've seen him. I think he's a good actor. I mean, he's okay. He's not, like, my favorite. But, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just felt like their relationship was just not super convincing. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I found kind of hard, it's hard to verbalize, but I didn't feel like it was very easy to tell the geography of their world. Really? Um, Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know, like, how much of that is just me being weird, but, like, I felt like the geography of the whole universe was difficult. I felt like in the first one I got it more. Interesting. Yeah, I feel like just the angles and the feng shui and everything was just weird for mm. me. Um, that's not really writing though. Well, like, that's production quality, I guess. So I can go back to that. Um, I would say I would give writing a four. Um, I would give this. I think I give this a four just because, kind of going with entertainment. There were a couple things that really kept me from being completely emotionally invested, and I feel like this is definitely something that could change upon another viewing. So this is kind of one that gets an asterisk. Um, well, to kind of go off what you're saying, to me the geography in this made perfect sense. Um, I thought they did a very good job, like visualizing the planet at times, like kind of showing you mm-hmm. north south. They're up here, they're down there. Maybe I like went to the thing. bathroom or closed my eyes during that time. No, I don't think so. No. Oh. Yeah. I, I think you that. get to the bathroom during an action scene, which was so reminiscent of The Last Samurai because the the Harkonnens. Har- yeah, is that right? Harkonnens, yeah. Harkonnens. They chase the Fremen into like this dusty sand kind mm-hmm. of fog thing. And then the Fremen are like coming out like bugs and like taking them out one by one. Oh. It's really It's really cool and creepy at the same time. <laughs> I like that scene. Anyway, that's not related to writing. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I think I, I didn't mind Chani as a character. Um, I do feel like maybe if she had been, I don't know. I, I think what well, I appreciate how there were different Fremen, different Fremen who had different opinions about the Madib, who I guess the, the Messiah character of Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that I think what they were trying to go for with Chani in this particular adaptation was that she wasn't pro the idea of, you know, someone in, coming in from another planet, right, and kind of controlling them again because they'd already been controlled mm-hmm. or, um, you know, oppressed, which was understandable. And I think the idea was that she liked Paul when he was being Paul and he wasn't becoming or it wasn't going down the route of being this other person, which is a very clear, distinct tonal shift once he does decide to go down that route. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't like it anymore. And I did feel that. I did feel like she was kind of scared and, like, frustrated that yeah. he was doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I just do wish they had, I had been a little more emotionally invested in their relationship prior to that because yeah. they didn't make it to me super clear that was the case. And Chani did always feel like she was annoyed at him, not in like a cute kind of way, just more like she was just annoyed at him in the world. And like, mm -hmm. I, I bought him liking her because he was, he's kind of a derpy, he was just a derpy guy before <laughs> he drank the juice. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the, the plot, I think, moved well. I think there was a lot going on. I think, um, it going from, you know, Paul learning the ways of the Fremen to Fade Ralph, um, coming in and kind of, well, okay, maybe, maybe I would have appreciated a bit more of like a dramatic turning point there because the Fremen are doing fine without... Paul taking on this particular role, and then mm -hmm. Fade Ralph comes in. That's supposed to be the turning yeah. point. But I almost wish there was more of a dramatic turning point. Like instead of the one scene where they blew up the entire, I guess, underground palace kind of thing, mm -hmm. I wish there had been a couple more like failed attempts to make me go like, oh no, this is bad. Mm -hmm. I'm really convinced, um, kind of thing. Um, I felt that the character of Gurney Halleck was kind of. Superfluous. Yeah. There's the scene at the end where he's like kind of blindly going through and, you know, slaying Harkonnen left and right because he's, you know, taking revenge for the Atreides. Mm -hmm. uh, or not, yeah, the Atreides. Um, and then there, he's supposed to have a face off with whatever the, the Harkonnen person is, um, Rabin. And it's a very kind of almost underwhelming scene. Because we were never shown any reason for this guy to have contempt for him, other than being told that he had contempt for mm -hmm. him. So it wasn't like there was a scene in the first movie where he did something to Gurney, and we were like, oh, that's nasty. I hope he gets revenge, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So much as he said it, he shows up. The, the fight scene's kind of just, it happens and it's done. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, all right, whatever. So I think the biggest sin is just that there were several aspects of it that didn't get me as emotionally invested as I did want mm. to but it's not like like you said nothing bad was bad about this and it was very grand and there was a lot going on and it was very neat to see um I felt the transition of Paul like I said going from the innocent boy that he was so to speak to the the messiah leader figure mm -hmm. was interesting because it, it's a total 180 of, like, personality and everything. Like, he becomes a very different person. And you can see why Chani is kind of, like, you know, taken aback and doesn't like this. And mm -hmm. you do genuinely wonder where it's going to go. Like, yeah, how, how is this going to come together? Because he's not... He's almost not a great person by the end of this movie. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of... I feel like he's hard to connect to. Yeah. Once he drinks the juice. And then, like, I'm kind of, I love, I found myself wondering, like, is this him acting like this voluntarily? Or is he, like, under the influence of something? Yeah. I did like how, uh, was it the character, um, Stilgar, and just, like, he, he and the, the, um, the other Fremen who believed in Paul were always, like, looking for any sort of evidence they could to prove that he was. No, him, was like, him eats a you know, snack. Sneezes. It's as it's written. As foretold. <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Yeah. Um, the world building in this, kind of going back to quality and writing combined, was just, I think that was really strong. Like, just, like, the whole relationship to water mm -hmm. is just so interesting and, yeah. like, almost, like, I've never seen it anywhere else before. It makes sense, but, like, oh, that's just such an interesting thing. Like, they have a pit underground of filled with the water of the dead Fremen that are distracted, and it's holy water, and you don't touch it. It's kind of like, sure, that's really weird, but that's just, that's interesting. That's an interesting world building yeah. choice right there. I just keep thinking about the water that they extract from bodies and what it tastes like, <laughs> and how I'm assuming it's kind of salty. I know. And for some reason. It's, it's not good water. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I mean, but they drink the water of people, obviously, because mm -hmm. what else are they going to do? It's true. It's like, is it salty? 
I mean, maybe it filters it. Yeah. Yeah. At least they, as weird as it was, at least it was, you know, a pretty clean process. (laughs) That's true. It was just a little weird. It was very slurpy. All right. Overall content. This is where we weigh the more negative content against the um, more positive aspects of the story or just the overall story itself. Was it necessary? Was it kind of offensive? Um, do we question why it was there? And this can include content like violence or sexuality or language. Um, what are your immediate thoughts? So, initially it was like, this is a fairly clean movie. Mm-hmm. However, I'm thinking about it now. So, language-wise, it was fine. Mm-hmm. Right? I don't yeah, remember there being any. Pretty decent as far as clean language. Violence-wise, nothing major other than, you know, all the killing and beating each other up. Yeah, but like, the end was definitely a bit more violent. But, like, it wasn't super gory. Yeah. But I was just thinking, I feel like the movie has a dark sexual undertone. Okay. Maybe not the whole movie, but certain parts of it. I feel mm, like there's a very strong, dark sexual undertone. With the Benny Jesseric. Yeah, of and like also, yeah, yeah, also Fade Ralpha or whatever. Like mm. every time I think about him, I just think about creepy sexual predatorial things. Mm. Like that's just the vibe that he put off. Interesting. And like they didn't really show a whole lot. And like I don't think to an unenlightened child that doesn't mm-hmm. know much about it, like I don't think they would really get that. But. The whole, the whole, um, whatever the bad guys are, B. Harkonnen, mm-hmm. I think has a very dark sexual vibe. Yeah. Which I think that yeah. goes hand in hand with somewhat demonic cultures. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, I didn't like that mm-hmm. very much. Like, it made me kind of uncozy. Yeah. Um, so, I'd say I'd give it a three. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, like, bad, Mm -hmm. but it was definitely very weird. It was, yeah, it's not, this is not a kid's movie. No. It's far from it. Um, I I overheard some review where they were like, I mean, I honestly think this should have been R. It definitely pushed it at times in terms of just, like, the darker tones of Mm -hmm. certain aspects of it. Um... Yeah, because, like, some scenes in the Harkonnen, certain, like, place, it was, like, this is really dark mm-hmm. and, like, yeah, like, all I can think of is, like, very dark sexual undertones that remind me of, like, the kind of weird rituals and stuff that, like, they would do in, like, pagan cultures. Maybe. I didn't quite get that impression from it. Really? No, not that extreme. There was definitely some darker sexual undertones, specifically related to the Benny Gesserit and Fade Ralph at a certain point. And then kind of just the the weird thing going on with the women in the Harkonnen that were kind of almost just things they used mm-hmm. and killed <laughs> at times, which yeah. was very dark. Um, like the, the Benny Gesserit, that, that's the premise, you know, the, of the story, mm-hmm. right? They've been doing this intentionally breeding and even bearing the children of certain people to kind of get to a point to have this Messiah-like figure for when the time comes, Mm -hmm. but with the intention of being able to control him. Um, The thing is that character ends up being Paul, which they can't control, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, shock. And then, like I said, the Harkonnens were just very bad vibes. (laughs) Very um, not good. And it's not like the film is trying to portray them in a good light. Yeah. It's, it, it knows they're bad and they're showing they're bad. Um, the violence, once again, nothing too graphic. It was, there was definitely implied more than anything, which and definitely was pretty um, brutal at I know, times. drowning the sandworm was pretty brutal. I know, that was so messed up. I know. The poor baby worm. I know. I heard, speaking of content <clears throat> so I, there was one review where someone kind of said something kind of weird about the baby sandworm by accident so the sandworms in the feminine culture are called makers mm. and they were talked about the baby sandworm and they called it a baby maker oh. and they stopped for a second like thought about how they put oh. that in. that didn't sound right <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not what i meant <laughs> baby maker. that's creepy i know the baby sandworm creeped me out i didn't like him but they shouldn't have drowned they shouldn't have drowned him they shouldn't have done that it's mm. bad 
And there's the scene with, there's actually the very intense scene, when, now I'm thinking about it, with Lady Jessica drinks the water mm-hmm. and she has like the weird... Convulsions. Spa- that was actually very intense. Yeah, that was pretty intense. Um, so yeah, I think a three is an appropriate thing. Like mm-hmm. there's nothing in here that's particularly um, offensive. It's just the overall tone of it kind of But to more towards, sensitive viewers. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. <sighs> Like, older teenagers mm-hmm. are kind of, yeah, where the limit would be on this one. Yeah, I feel like it was a little disturbing to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm a more sensitive viewer. More sensitive viewer. Yes. Okay, well, that's, those are the four categories. I'm, I'm thinking of so many other things to mention now that we're at the end, but we've got to wrap this up. Because mm-hmm. um, this was a dense movie. There was a lot in it. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of interesting things, a lot of cool things. Like... I do have to go back to entertainment for a second now and talk about the the sandworm riding scene that Paul has mm-hmm. for the first time. I was so scared they were going to mess that up because the trailer showed it and went, how are they going to make this interesting? Him jumping mm-hmm. on a sandworm and riding it for the first time. Like, yeah. There's, I'm curious to know how this is going to be entertaining. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was, and as you mentioned, that was probably the most stressful scene in the entire mm-hmm. film. They nailed that in terms of like it being such an overwhelming, experiential, stressful scene. Yeah, I feel like I felt some sort of like <laughs> twinge in my stomach while I was watching it. I know it was. They did not disappoint, and they probably knew they were having. They'd have a hard time with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought it was so clever visually when they showed. Paul pulling on the different flaps of the mm-hmm. different segments and the, the holes, which I assume just don't want to get filled with sand. It's like, oh, that's how he's controlling it. Mm. I just thought that was a very, like, that was a top tier mm-hmm. like, filmmaking. Right yeah. There. Anyway, that's that aside. <laughs> um, overall rating. What would you give this for your overall rating scale of one to five? I'm torn between a three and a four mm-hmm. because... I'd give it a four because it was like, it doesn't, in my opinion, I'm speaking solely for my, I'm, it's my opinion. I'm not yeah. speaking against the movie mm-hmm. because it was a good movie. I'm just a bad person. That's not true. <laughs> no, I would say I'd give it a three for me personally. Okay. I think it deserved a four or a five mm-hmm. as far as that, that goes. But like mm-hmm. from a personal level, from I would give person, it a three. Okay. Gotcha. I'm going to give this... Once again, an asterisk and a four. (laughs) I think this very easily could move up. Um, Like I said, I'm very, very interested to watch it again, even though I might have to be by myself. (laughs) Maybe with Spud in 18 years. (laughs) Um, I think, yeah, there's a a lot there. It's one that I think can be rewatchable if you do like this kind of stuff. I can see why people love this. just because it, it has everything that people do like about movies and stories, et cetera, et cetera. It's definitely, I could see it definitely being more of a guy movie than a girl movie. Yeah, I think that's part of why I was just like... <laughs> oh, boring dude stuff. I know. Writing sandworms. I got just my girl just, movie fix this there week. There you go. There you go. But yeah, I would recommend it to people. If someone wanted to see it, I'd be like, yeah, go see it. I think you'll have a good time. It's it's worth the, the money and time if this is what's important to you. Like Yeah. Um Yeah, I think I don't think that you will come away from this feeling like you lost something. Because even if you don't enjoy it, I felt like there's this had something to offer in terms of you know, thought provoking thought provoking aspects of the story, or if it is even just the visual That's aspects, nice. like just being able to appreciate the hard work that was put into this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that would be my take on it. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, Savannah over here is falling asleep as we speak, so we we got to get her to Betty Bye. Got to tuck her in and go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you all for listening, and we hope you've been inspired to have some more conversation around the movies you're watching, maybe even this film. Um, let us know what you thought of this movie and our personal take on it in the comments. Um, and let us know how we did on the rating. And until next time, good film hunting. <laughs>